Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Sorrows, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. On that first Good Friday, on that most holy and solemn day of our Lord's death, the Heavenly Father was given the greatest extrinsic glory that has ever been offered by man to God. Never before in human history has the Most High been so adored, so worshipped, never before given such thanksgiving, such perfect reparation, such infinite satisfaction to the divine justice. The mystery of the Holy Incarnation, true God becoming true man, the eternal word becoming flesh in Mary's most holy womb, that brought about a personal union, a hypostatic union between the second person of the most blessed Trinity and a mere created nature. Therefore, every drop Every drop of blood shed during the agony from the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the way of the cross and the crucifixion, every sigh of the God-man, especially his dying breath, gave infinite glory to the Most High God and repaired a hundredfold, a thousandfold, infinitely, whatever crimes committed by Adam and his children. And as a result of this fact, the Heavenly Father's heart was filled with more compassion and mercy for the miseries of men than ever before on Good Friday. God the Father looked down upon mankind on that Friday so long ago and saw us through the red wounds of his divine Son. Therefore, on this anniversary of Christ's death, on this day in which Good Friday is represented liturgically, the prayers of the church, the prayers of miserable sinners like us, have a greater hearing than ever before, a greater efficacy of our prayers on this day, unlike any other day. The power of the church's tears united with the most precious blood of her divine spouse extends, stretches out the maternal solicitude of the church and the divine concern of the Heavenly Father to all of the needs of the whole human race, to all men, be they believers or even infidels, be they true Christians, Catholics, or be they heretics and schismatics, be they the new Israel, the church, with face unveiled, or the old Israel in blindness, be they sick, the suffering, the dying, the deceased, those in danger of storms, even to travelers on this day, for the Pope for the bishops, prayers for the priests, they're heard on this day. The hierarchy in general, be they clerics, also the religious, the lay folk that we should all pray for, be they civil leaders elected to office or appointed to a position of authority, for mercy extends to all on this day. No one is excluded. Good Friday is a day of mercy unlike any other. Therefore, let us attend today during the Mass of the Pre-Sanctified to what are known as the solemn prayers, those solemn intercessions, those holy intercessions for we are granted a divine hearing on this day like no other day of the year. Let us consider, consider, rather, some of these solemn intercessions in a specific way. In particular, 
for the prayer of the church, the prayer for the church, the church of true believers, as well as the prayer for those in religious error, as also those prayers for the new Israel, the church, as well as the prayers for the old Israel. Let us consider the first prayer that the priest will recite today for the solemn intercessions. Quote, let us pray, dearly beloved, for the holy church of God. We pray for the church because she's our mother and she is a holy mother and we owe her everything. She baptized us. She confirmed us. She fed us with the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Son of God. She will even be with us at the end when we're dying, giving us the anointing, the extreme unction. And she will pray for our souls, even in death, when we're buried in the ground in terms of our body. And if we come to heaven, we will owe our salvation not just to Christ, but also to his bride, the mystical body, the church. And so we pray for her. The prayer continues. We pray for the church that our Lord and God may deign to give it peace. When there is peace, the gospel is spread in a more effective way. We also pray to keep the church in unity. The unity of faith first and foremost. But let us not forget the unity and the bond of true charity. We also ask our Lord to guard the church throughout the whole world, protect it. And we ask that all of the principalities and powers, both preternatural and natural, be subjected to the church. We also grant or ask that the church be granted a peaceful and quiet life. Let us pray for the church on these days. Let us also consider another solemn intercession that we make during the Good Friday Mass of the Presanctified. Again, so powerful on this day. Quote, let us pray also for heretics and schismatics. We don't pray in that way in sort of the modern view of the church membership, do we? And you wonder why there's not many conversions today. Are we praying for those who are in religious error and are therefore blinded? Or do we want to use political correctness and put that over the very salvation of a man in darkness? Let us pray for heretics and schismatics. We pray for that our Lord would be pleased to rescue them from their errors. That's the prayer. And recall them. Recall them back to our Holy Mother, the Catholic and Apostolic Church. That's the prayer we pray in the old rite. Then we also pray, and we'll consider this as the last part of this meditation, the prayer for the faithless Jews. And again, let us not be liturgically correct, which is far worse than being politically correct. Let us not fall prey to that tendency to erase these prayers from the church and the saints of old. The prayer for the Jews in the pre-1955 Mass of the Pre-Sanctified on Good Friday reads as follows. Let us also pray for the faithless Jews. In Latin, it's perfidis judeis. That Almighty God may remove the veil, the veil that was spoken of in St. Paul's letters, the veil from their hearts, so that they too may acknowledge Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray. Almighty and eternal God, who does not exclude anyone from thy mercy, even Jewish faithlessness. 
Are we praying in the same way today? Even in the old rite of 1955 forward. Here are prayers which we offer. The prayer continues for the blindness of that people that acknowledging the light of thy truth, which is Christ, they may be delivered from their darkness. Unquote. That's how we used to pray. And I think that on that Good Friday, which is the most important and efficacious day for prayers to be heard, that when we compromise that prayer, edit it, you wonder if there's less conversions, if people remain in darkness and faithlessness. As many of you might know, the word prophetias, faithless, was taken out of the Good Friday prayers by Pope John the Twenty-Third. But in the literature of the Church Fathers, the word prophetias doesn't mean treacherous or nefarious or sneaky. It means faithless. And it is the right word to designate the idea of being unfaithful to the commitment that one has undertaken. All salvation comes through the Jews. All salvation comes from the Jews. They were God's people in the Old Testament. And they were to prepare this world for the coming of one of their own. But though he was one of their own, he was not received by his own. The Israelites accepted the Old Covenant, which was always directed towards bringing forth the Messiah. But with most not having received him when he came, they were guilty of being faithless to the Lord. Thus, the phraseology is absolutely correct. There was nothing wrong with that prayer. Pius XII introduced the first unnecessary change by inserting the standard instruction of the priest reciting Oremus and the deacon and subdeacon calling for kneeling and rising, which had purposely been excluded from the prayers from the Jews in the past. The pre-1955 liturgy excludes the genuflection. The reason is that the church considered it inappropriate to use at this point in which reference is made to the faithlessness of the Jews. The same gesture, the genuflection, as the Jewish soldiers did when they mocked Jesus. They mocked him with the genuflection. And as mentioned previously, John the Twenty Third continued the trend of accommodating to political pressures by removing the word prophetes from the Good Friday prayer, faithless. The rite of Paul VI simply jettisoned the traditional prayer altogether, replacing it with a typically politically correct text that would better suit a hallmark greeting card than a prayer for true conversion. Again, on that Good Friday, that first one, the Heavenly Father was given the greatest extrinsic glory that has ever been offered by man to God. And as a result of this fact, the Heavenly Father's heart was filled with more compassion and mercy for the miseries of men than ever before on Good Friday. God the Father looked down upon mankind on that Friday so long ago, and he saw us through the red wounds of his divine Son become flesh. Therefore, on this anniversary of Christ's holy death, on this day in which Good Friday is represented liturgically, the prayers of the church, the prayers of miserable sinners like ourselves, has a greater hearing and a greater efficacy than on any other day of the year. 
So pray this liturgy well today. For the good Lord is very attentive to our prayers, especially if we pray them with purpose, with clarity, without ambiguity, and with real true need.